All right. Good morning, everybody. Happy Father's Day. Thank you. Have you yeah, Father Doug. Uh, no. How many fathers are there in the room? Uh, raise your hand. Other rooms? Good. Congratulations, you guys. Happy Father's Day. I am excited about uh, where we're going. We're dealing with this study uh, in, entitled God's Plan. And it is interesting. God has a plan for you. Uh, everybody know that? God has a plan for you? Uh, you know, so today actually marks something interesting about God's plan. This is, this is actually one year since Krista and I came back to church on the way. And we are thrilled to be back here. This is um, actually uh, day 365. We count them off every day on the wall. At home. No, we don't do that. But, uh, but we are thrilled to be back. Um, and we're in this, the middle of this series. And I, the thing I've really loved about this series is the intention about it that if we follow God's plan, then God's purpose can be fulfilled in our life. But if we do things that are outside or aren't on God's plan, we could end up short-circuiting the ultimate purpose that God has for us or the plan that he intends for us. And frankly, I do not want to be a, perp- a person that short-circuits God's plan. Anyone else? You know, I mean, when, when you think about that, that my actions could keep uh, the, could, could hinder the fullness of God really working in my life. I, I want to be careful than the things that I do and that I really do live according to God's plan. I mean, that's a huge thing. Part of understanding God's plan then, as we're talking about this, is to understand what spiritual gifts are all about. And it is important for us to understand spiritual gifts, so much so that uh, Paul writes to the Corinthians. He says, now, dear brothers and sisters, regarding your question about special abilities the Spirit gives us or spiritual gifts, he says, I don't want you to misunderstand this. And I would say, regarding spiritual gifts, the church at large around the world, um, there's too much misunderstanding in regarding this subject. I'm not saying everybody else is wrong. I'm just saying there's areas that still need to be learned and still need to be, uh, be dealt with. And in fact, Paul makes this emphasis so strongly the, the word for misunderstanding really means don't be ignorant. He's saying, I don't want you to be ignorant in this. In other words, I want you to get it. I want you to understand it because you're going to uh, live differently if you'll understand this. So when I was younger um, and first started learning about spiritual gifts, I was raised in a church, but I wasn't raised in a church that knew about spiritual gifts. We didn't have those pages in our Bible. They weren't there. And uh, I say that a little tongue-in-cheek, but we really never talked about it at all. And so when I started to learn about spiritual gifts, uh, I, I remember somebody saying, you should take a spiritual gifts test. And so, I, and I don't know if you're familiar with the spiritual gifts test uh, or if you've taken them or not. I won't have you raise your hand if you, if you have. I'm okay with spiritual gifts tests, but I kind of think they miss the mark a bit. What they are is a test that has, I don't know, somewhere between 50 and 150 questions, depending on the one that you take. And when they assess it, they will determine which gifts out of, uh, which gift mix out of a group of about 20 to 25 gifts that are all found in the Bible, um, where you fit in the midst of that and what your gift gift mix is. And I'm not opposed to these. However, I will say they they make a, a critical mistake, and that is that not all things are the same. Say that with me. Not all things are the same. For example, one of these tests that's really popular, it's been around now nearly five decades, it's being used, it's still used um, regularly, and it helps determine your unique gift mix amongst 25 gifts in Scripture, and they are all found in Scripture, but in addition to the three lists that we're dealing with in this study, the gifts of the Father, the gifts of the Son, and the gifts of the Holy Spirit, which I think that comes out to 20 uh, in that uh, list, in addition to that... Um, They also throw in other gifts that are actually called gifts in Scripture, but they're not in those same categories. And so, for example, as you go through this, you might find that on that same list is giving and poverty. Anybody want to make a choice there, which one you'd, you'd rather have, you know? And also on that same list, you, you might find faith and celibacy. And I don't have any choice there uh, which one to take. And so... Uh, I, I'm saying that any of these, uh, not, not, they, they're bad, but I think that lumping all the gifts together plus pulling in other gifts that are found in Scripture from different places can cause us to miss the real purpose 
of how spiritual gifts are intended to work in our lives. And we have to come to the place where we aren't ignorant toward that. In other words, we don't gain a misunderstanding because I truly believe you can't understand the gift if you don't understand the giver. Let me say it again. You can't understand the gift if you don't understand the giver. Have you ever gotten a gift from someone that you go, what in the world? Why did they give me that? You know, and, and then, you, then you start to, to look and you start to think about the person that gave it to you and you go, oh, I get it. You know, I, it, it makes sense. I, I've actually got something sitting on my desk at home that is so unlike anything I would ever uh, put on my desk. But I know the person that gave it to me and I know what they intended about the gift that they gave to me. And it actually means a lot when I see that because I know the giver. And so the same thing's true with spiritual gifts. To properly understand spiritual gifts, we have to know who gave them, the timing they were given, the purpose they were given, and what that gift itself is all about. And though there are some individual gifts that get thrown into the bucket of spiritual gifts, the majority of them come from three portions of Scripture. Uh, Ephesians chapter 4, Pastor Tim dealt with that last week. It gives five gifts given by Jesus the Son to his church um, after our point of salvation. These are ministry gifts. They're for the equipping of the saints, uh, for the work of the ministry, for the operation of his church. And you'll find these gifts uh, scattered throughout the church, that uh, particular mix, for the sake of things that can advance his church to do the work of the kingdom that it's intended to. And that message last week, Pastor Tim, was awesome. I, I loved the way you looked into that and, uh, and the... Um, we call it the humanizing, the, the practicalizing of those gifts to really understand what that was all about. If you missed it, find it online. You can find it at our website, on our, uh, on our uh, media page, our messages page, and, and go through that. It's a worthwhile teaching to hear. Starting next week, we're going to talk about the second list, uh, which is actually the uh, gifts of the Spirit. It contains the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit um, to, that come to the believer at the point of Holy Spirit fullness. These are the manifestation gifts. They're literally the power of God entrusted to believers to extend his kingdom. And when people talk about spiritual gifts, this is more likely the thing that they're, they're looking at, that particular list, the gifts of the Spirit out of 1 Corinthians chapter 12. They don't always deal with the one we're going to deal with today or the one Pastor Tim dealt with last week, and they certainly don't think of some of the other ones that are scattered around, but they all somehow get lumped together in, in that in some, uh, sometimes in teaching. So today on Father's Day, we're actually going to deal with Romans chapter 12, which is the gifts given by Father God. Doesn't that sound like a good thing to do on Father's Day? And uh, these are oftentimes referred to as the motivational gifts. They're given to us at creation, at, uh, at your creation not at creation of the world, but when you were created, designed by God, this is what he implanted in you and what he decided uh, you would be. And so they're given at creation, and they are the, the, the tools of what life itself is about for you. So all of these lists, when you look at three distinct different givers, timings, purposes, and gifts, we can't lump them together. They're not all the same. And so Pastor Tim will talk more about that next week. But today... Uh, as we look at Romans chapter 12, gifts given by the Father to humankind at creation, they're given to every human. This is part of who you are. It what, it's what makes you who you are. And as believers, our goal is to learn how to operate in the things that God's created us to be, how to operate in a way that uh, we will utilize the gifts God's given us for the sake of serving others around us. And we'll talk about that in the passage. But I want you to remember this. Since the Father's the one who's given them, um, they're given even to those that don't end up serving the Lord with their life. And so those gifts are still in there. And you'll, you'll actually see people in the world that don't know anything about the Lord. They haven't given their life to serve him. And you can see the gifts that God's given them actually implanted inside their life. We'll talk about how some of those things work in a minute, but... Uh, but but you will, you will recognize it as we talk through this. So we need to make the determination of how to make those things uh, uh, work in our life. So here we go, Romans chapter 12. If you want to open to that, uh, look it up on your phone, go to it in your Bible, take the stone tablets that you brought along uh, and uh, read through in that, that would be fine. It starts out, we're going to start with verse 3. It says, because of the privilege and authority, that privilege and authority is the Greek word charis. It's the word for grace. So he's saying, because of the grace that has been granted to me, I grant you a warning. 
So it's the grace that's been given to me. I'm going to give you this warning. So there's grace that's been shown to me, but I want to warn you some, about something now. And he says, don't think of yourself better than you really are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourself, measuring yourself by the faith God has given us. Just as our bodies have many parts and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts and one body, and we all belong to each other. So you and I are each part of the bigger picture of God's plan. When we talk about God's plan, we are not just looking for God's plan for me. We're looking for how God wants to utilize me in the midst of his plan for everything that that will affect, and that means God's plan for me affects you. And God's plan for you affects me. Look at the person next to you. They are part of God's plan in your life, actually. Because the word says that as we gain these gifts that God's given to us, it's for the sake of all of us together because the word actually tells us we belong to each other. That is a really strong statement right there. And I'm not going to take time to unpack that one, but that is a big picture. The Father has equipped us for something specific And he has an intention of who else we would impact or influence with those particular gift sets uh, that we have. And so it goes on in verse 6, and it says, in his grace, again, that's the word uh, charis, it says he has given us different gifts. That is the word charismatos, which means um, a gift of grace. So it's saying in his grace, he has given us gifts of grace. So God's grace is given to you in the manner of gifts of grace for doing certain things well. So there's something in who you are that is a gift of God's grace for who you can be. In other words, God's created who you are, but there's, a, there's an application of that that we now have to come to that determines who we can be, what we're going to be all about. And so this Greek word, this is where we get the Greek word, this is the Greek word where we get the term charismatic. So charismatic is a word that has application within the church because it's generally, it's a term that means those that would would follow in the midst of those, uh, the gifts that the Spirit uh, would give or the grace uh, gifts that are given to us. But in the world, the term charismatic is used as well, which doesn't have anything to do with a Christian term. A charismatic person in the world is one that people want to follow, that people, uh, that they have the ability to influence and move people, and, and they, they engage people in things, and which is kind of interesting because I honestly believe that term charismatic that's utilized in the world is, the, is still as a result of the charismata, the gifts of grace that God's given to us that he's influenced even people in the world with. So you find a charismatic person uh, in, the, in the world that has nothing to do with God, I still believe they're walking in a gift that God's given to them. They just don't know how to utilize it yet. They're, they're not utilizing it for the purpose of God, but they may be utilizing it. They may even be utilizing it well in what they're doing because I, I don't think every unbeliever is a bad person. There's a lot of good ones. We, we can't make those lines drawn like that. But, uh, but imagine what a person that we consider to be charismatic in the world could do if they utilize that gift for the sake of God's purpose in their life. You know, and so that's the goal that we're trying to, to uh, get to. Uh, in all reality, what charismatic means is those operating in the gifts of God's grace. Say that with me, operating in the gifts of God's grace. So the chapter goes on to say, so if God's given you the ability to prophesy, speak out as much, uh, in as much faith as God has given you. If your gift is serving um, others, then serve them well. If you're a teacher, teach well. If your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. If it's giving, give generously. If uh, God's given you leadership ability, take the responsibility seriously. And if you have the gift of showing kindness to others, then do it gladly. So God has these gifts of grace that he's given to all of us to do certain things, and he's given these particular gifts to us that are mentioned here at creation. In other words, there is some point, one or more of these that all of us have that is part of who he's made us to be. So I want to ask this question. What would the church at large, Christianity in general, not the church of the way, but Christianity in general, what would it look like if believers truly experience the fullness of God's grace that he's implanted in them, do you think it might in some way change the opinions that others have of church or others have of Christians? I think it would. I I really think it would. So let me ask this. What about 
the area that we can deal with. What would our church, the church on the way, look like if we really showed grace in everything that we did? Now, I got to say, I, I, I believe that is always our intent. But is there anyone here that has ever stumbled into a place you haven't shown grace in a situation? And thank you for the three hands that were just raised. <laughs> you know, we, we are people, and people can make mistakes and not get it right and do some things that, uh, that might be offensive or difficult at times. And, and, and so what if we just continued when we find those points to say, Lord, help me walk in the grace that you desire for me to be. Let me, let me become a person, especially when we're dealing with those outside the church so that we start to influence the world around us in a way that they would say, man, if that's what it means to be a believer, I want to be part of that. And uh, that's the kind of direction I'd like to see us uh, get to that. So God's grace here uh, is here because it's poured out on us. Every one of us have it if we have these gifts of grace on us. And that grace is not supposed to be a spectator sport. It's not something we just look at. Oh, look at that person. Look at what they have the ability to do. Or, or look at this gift that's at work in their life. No, it's something that we are all engaged in. In other words, we are all gifted with his grace and designed to be conduits of that grace for the world around us. It's how life is supposed to be lived. And when we learn to move in these gifts of grace, then the joy of the Lord becomes abundant in the lives of other people, and they start to see it. And that's why Paul starts this chapter. We began reading in verse 3, but he starts it with verses 1 and 2, which seemed like a good place to start before verse 3, right? Uh, but verses 1 and 2 actually say this. He says, dear brothers and sisters, he says, I plead with you. Remember, he's about to talk about the gifts of the Father. But he says, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he's done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice. In other words, he's saying everything that you do, let it be unto the Lord as a sacrifice unto him. Um, because he will find that sacrifice acceptable. This is truly the way we worship him. Don't copy the behaviors and customs of the world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. God, don't let me be conformed to the thought processes of the world. Change the way I think. And there are times that we can even stumble into following those thought processes. Then he says... Then you will learn what is God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. So we're gifted from God by creation to live according to that lift, uh, gift, but don't be conformed to the brokenness of the world around you. I want to say, even if sometimes the world is able to make sense out of it, don't be conformed to it. By the way, on the other hand, we also don't want to beat them with a stick or your Bible. Don't do any Bible whipping on people, okay? But live according to the way God's called you to live, and you're going to start to have a transforming work on the world around you. Wow, you know, it's such a cool passage. Then he goes on to talk about these, uh, these gifts. So there's seven motivational gifts that are woven into the fabric of our lives, or that, that one or more of them are. They're prophecy, serving, teaching, um, encouragement or exhortation, that same, same term, giving, leading, and mercy, or kindness and mercy are, are kind of the same one. So created into humankind with the original intent of motivating us to serve one another. That's what the Bible says. That's why they're there. Created so that we will motivate one another. It's, it's in who we are. And every single one of us has some of these motivational gifts on the basis of who we are, and we all see life through the lens of the gift that God has given to you. In other words, we are all looking at the same thing differently. We see it with a different lens. Do you have a red lens on? Do you have a yellow lens on? Do you have a clear lens on? We're all seeing the same thing, but we see it with different, um, from different perspective. And I'll talk about that uh, in a minute as we go through each of these gifts. But our basic motivational gift mix determines how we will see the needs and opportunities that we face 
and how we'll go about dealing with them because it's just the way you're wired. It's just the way what God's placed inside of you. And we have to take those things God's placed inside of us and say, how do we utilize those now for his kingdom's sake? So we're going to take a really practical look at this now. I want to go through this. I want to show you some of the identifying factors of each of these seven gifts. I actually want to show you some of the difficulties of each of these seven gifts because every one of, almost all of them have places that, you know, if you get uh, that, you can stumble into things and not see things from the perspective of, of others. And I want to just exhort you with this, that you can decide if you're exercising the gift that God's given to you. I want to encourage you or challenge you in that, to look for whether or not you, you're going to see yourself in the things I'm going to talk about. And I want to ask you to consider, am I utilizing this properly? And you also have the ability to determine whether or not there are areas that you need to ask the Lord to help you to do better in the midst of what God's created to be. So let's jump into this. The seven gifts, let's explain them. Uh, prophecy is the first one. It starts off with this gift. This is actually the only one of the gifts that's actually listed in all three lists, um, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. However, I'm completely convinced that in every list, it's a different thing. So it has similar aspects, but it operates differently. Jesus' office of the prophet to equip the church. Pastor Tim talked about that uh, last week. The Holy Spirit's gift of prophecy for the sake of edification, exhortation, comfort for the recipient, uh, which we'll talk about within a couple weeks. And um, in my opinion, those two are very different from the personal makeup of the prophetic lifestyle that God would desire to, that God gives to people and has them operate. This is the gift from the Father. But uh, the office of the prophet we heard about last week, as we get to the gift of prophecy, I think you're going to see that all these things operate a little differently. So the prophetic gift from the Father produces a person who sees things from the perspective of the problem or the opportunity or recognizes sin and identifies a direction to move as the future, in the future. So the church needs people that have this prophetic gift in their life so that it can uh, help the church continue, the church being all of us, to continue to move in the right direction. In other words, they see things about, about how God would have us move or what would be the next direction or how to, how to watch out for things that are uh, opposing us or the sin that's around. But by the same token... Uh, uh, this person can can sometimes become a little harsh or, or they actually only see things from a black and white perspective. There's no gray in the midst of those areas. In other words, it's, it's sin or it's not sin. And though I don't completely disagree with that, I recognize the fact there's a lot of times when it's, when it's, when it's sin, there's a process of moving people toward that to, that place of, of not sin. So the, the prophet would look at things this way. Someone spills coffee, and they would say, I could have told you that would happen. <laughs> you know, they're, they're, one of the negative aspects of this, they can stumble into pride. However, these people are immensely helpful in keeping us from drifting, keeping us from losing track of our mission. Um, uh, they might need to work to be a little bit kinder and not legalistic, but but when you look at this, we need this kind of person in our midst. And I, I mentioned already that even unbelievers can have these gifts. So how in the world would a gift like that work in the lives of an unbeliever? Well, i got to tell you, a, a non-God utilization of this gift is a person that's a business leader that has the ability to, um, to truly assess the direction their industry is heading. They're the ones that are on the cusp of something new. They step into something uh, ahead of time. They may be an entrepreneur who sees what needs to be accomplished in the future. I have a friend who is an entrepreneur, and he would sit and talk with me about things that he has or some new business idea. And I'd sit there and think, that is crazy. There is no way you'll ever make money in that. And then he starts to make money hand over fist, and it becomes successful. And I say, man, I wish I'd gotten in with you. He said, well, too late now. Uh, and so... <laughs> These are the Bill Gates, the Elon Musk type people, the ones that just think different. They're looking out forward, you know, and, and that is a, a person that, that could be utilizing that gift for the sake of the kingdom, but instead they've got it utilized for the sake of something that, that you know, is a secular aspect. And so to live according to God's purpose, how would we do that if we've got this gift? Well, we need to tune into God. 
We need to connect with him and ask him, what, how do we use this and how do we hear God's voice and, and unequivocally follow verse 3 that we read, don't think you're better than you really are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourself, measuring yourself by the faith that God's given us. So the next one is serving. And uh, this is kind of a cool gift. Let me, let me give you the unique differences between um, the prophetic motivational gift and the serving one. The prophetic one will point out the problem uh, with what you did, but the serving one will look at how they can help you clean up the mess that you're in. So a servant is the one that's willing to get their hands dirty. They're willing to walk in there and do the things that, uh, that need to be done. They're wanting to seek to make things right again. So if someone spills their coffee... And the servant is the one that will clean up the mess. And we have to have people like that. The person with the serving motivational gift is likely to help others even to the point of not helping themselves. They may be there fixing your leaky roof while their roof is leaking. They just see with this compassionate heart of serving and and does anybody know people that are servants? Like, you can, you can see those kind of people. We're pointing at people now, I see. Uh, okay. Give them uh, applications to work with the kids. Um, <laughs> servants help motivate us to serve. People that have this, this deep inside gift of serving motivate the rest of us because we are all called to serve, by the way. Whether or not you have that, that uh, motivational gift or not, we're all called to serve, but the servant is the one that helps us see it's possible to do. You know, the servant is the one that would say, come on, you can work with two-year-olds over in the kids' building, you know, when the rest of us are going, are you kidding, two-year-olds? I'm terrified of two-year-olds. And the servant's going, come on, we can do it. And, uh, you know, the, we need these people. They, they really, and so you can obviously see the application in, in the secular community as well. You know people that are servants. You've, you've, got, you've got friends and neighbors that don't believe, and you see that serving gift inside their life. Imagine what happens when that person gets on fire for Christ. Imagine what happens when those of us that are on fire for Christ, if we have that gift, that we start to really realize how to utilize it. Teaching is another one. The servant may work to clean up everyone's messes, and the prophet may point the finger saying, I knew that would happen. But the teacher would say, I tried to warn you about that, and I hope you learned your lesson. And uh, uh, someone spills the coffee, and the teacher looks for the lesson in it. That's the uh, application there. Teachers are really interested in, um, in, the, in the data. They, they, they know the information. They really believe everybody else wants to know it, even if they don't. And, uh, but, but we really need these people in our lives because they give us the information and the direction that uh, um, helps us keep on track spiritually. And a good, godly teacher is one that can keep us from falling prey to false teachers. And we've got a world that is constantly trying to confuse people and a devil that is always wanting to deceive people. And there are people that will rise up where the enemy will even utilize someone's potential teaching gift, God-given gift, but to utilize them for error. And that's where we need the godly teachers that will continue to, to move us in that direction. But people with that gift, they're so well-researched, so much data, they might actually become boring at times, but to uh, uh, live with that, they, they might have tons of information. By the way, I have a, uh, a relative, uh, extended relative, it's not in my immediate family, that knows knows so much about everything. I, I mean, literally, and they do. They're always the smartest person in every room that they walk into. They know so much about everything, but they think I want to know it. <laughs> so I'll just say, you know, how's your coffee? And we start all of a sudden talking about a World War II battle that I didn't even know ever existed, <laughs> nor do I care, you know? And uh, it's, so if you've got the teaching gift, just be cautious of, of how you utilize it. Hopefully this message isn't becoming like that, um, but we should, we should probably move on. But, uh, but listen, that, the teaching gift is, is one that really is instilled in people. And, and you, can, you can probably, can you think of who was your favorite teacher when you were growing up? Just anywhere? elementary school, middle school, high school, you know, it's like I had some really good teachers that I know had that teaching gift. I also have some that I questioned, but, uh, but realistically, that's part of what drives people to start teaching in whatever aspect they do. So there's a gift inside of there. Um, exhortation, the motivational gift of exhortation, kind of like 
stirs up the faith or stimulates faith in other people. And sometimes they might oversimplify things, you know, because they're just trying to, to help people understand. But they, they'll oftentimes have a quick and easy way to solve things or make a person feel better about themselves. So when someone spills their coffee... Uh, they're going to give them a simple plan that will keep the same thing from happening again in the future. And they're the ones who usually have the three simple steps. Um, we had at the last church we were at, had someone who was really an exhorter. I mean, he could really make you feel good about anything, but always had three simple steps. So he would be the one that would say, you take the coffee cup, make sure the lid's on tight, turn it right so that the seam is in the back, and then set it down carefully so you don't spill it again next time, okay? You know, and so they, they but, but, uh, but I want you to know you can do this. I know you can do this. You know, that, that's an exhorter. An or, exhorter is the person that helps stimulate you to believe that you can accomplish something that you didn't think you can accomplish, even in your faith. An exhorter in the midst of uh, Christianity is someone that really helps stimulate us in our faith to the point that we can start seeing what it is God wants us to become and uh, have the ability to do what it is God desires for us to do. And exhorters both have the ability to motivate the troops. Um, and we also, if you're an exhorter, you also have to be sure you don't just become an unnecessarily cheerleader, unnecessarily a cheerleader, just cheering somebody on. I mean, encourage them, help build them up, but recognize when it's time for them to start to fly uh, on their own. And um, this ends up becoming the, a gift that is so important in the body of Christ because we we so I can't tell you how many times you'll talk to people. And in fact, let me ask this: Do you ever get to the place in your faith where you think, "Oh, I will never get past this"? The, the exhorter is the one that says, "You will. You can do this. Let me let me pray with you. I'll stand with you. I'll walk with you through this thing." And so we need these people desperately leading. The gift of, uh, I'm sorry, I skipped giving. Giving is a person with this motivational gift. They are unselfish. Um, they, they look for ways that they can utilize their resources to help other people. And they are usually, as a result, blessed with an abundance of resources. And so with that blessing allows them to utilize that gift all the more. And so when someone spills their coffee, the giving person is going to go buy them another cup of coffee. And probably going to go and hire Starbucks to come and be here next time. So if this happens again, we're all ready for it, you know. And uh, anybody know someone with a gift of giving? You know, that's an amazing gift. It is, it is something that is just so innate in people. And frankly, probably all of us need to pray for a little bit of that. And uh, I have a friend that said uh, the, the, the cure for greed is giving. And so if, if we're a person that wants to hold on, maybe the issue is we need to give. And God helps stimulate both faith and that gift of giving inside of us. Leading. The person with the motivational gift of leadership knows uh, they know how to get the job done. They can give directions. They can take care of situations or move something to the next level. And we need these uh, people in our life. So if someone were to spill their coffee, the leader would tell the servant to get the mop and the giver to go get another cup of coffee and the exhorter to figure out how the problem doesn't happen again. And uh, the leader, leaders just take charge. And sometimes a leader can be bossy, uh, controlling, maybe micromanaging. Um, uh, however, they probably do have the best idea. And so if you have that gift of leadership, you need to learn how do you take that best idea that you have and help lead others toward it. Because it's not just having the information. It's knowing how to lead other people uh, into this. So they are... So here's the interesting thing about leaders. Any, anybody here a Survivor fan? Survivor? Oh, more in this service than others. Praise the Lord. I think that makes a total of about eight of us over the whole uh, day. But um, I'm, a, I'm a total Survivor fanatic. I watch them all since, since the beginning of the second season. I didn't see the first one because they ate rats. Who cared? Uh, but, uh, ugh. Uh, but from the second, and I love it because I love examining the motivational gifts in people that are on, on the show. I watch Survivor because of the human side of it. I want to see what's going on with people. Because when you put them to this kind of test, you see what the fabric of them is really all about. But here's the interesting thing. You get to Survivor and you start to watch now. They get to the beach and the exhorter is trying to, uh, is trying to uh, um, uh, help people understand that they can really do this and pull through. And the person that's crying over in the corner, they're always, they're over there trying to help them. And the 
the mercy person is trying to help people feel better about the fact they've got a sunburn after 30 minutes of being in the sun, and they're going to be out there now for 26 days, and, and the servant is out there collecting firewood, and the leader is the one that's saying, hey, we got to get a shelter built here and a fire built over there and make sure we've got enough water, and they're putting everything in place. And now everybody else is gathering around the well, figuring out how they can vote the leader out at the first tribal council. <laughs> The leader is always the first person voted out. In fact, uh, I think that the theme of Survivor should be the inept to vote out the capable, uh, but because that kind of seems to be the way it, it works sometimes. But uh, if you're a leader, guard against being bossy, but recognize the fact you really may have the best idea to help people, uh, but, but we've got to help people. So go get yourself an exhorter that will help you get the, the point across to folks. Last one here is mercy. And I love this gift. I like watching people that have this gift. I admit I don't have a lot of this gift, but I have a huge respect for it. However, I will say the older I get, the more mercy I see in my life. And I think that a mercy gift is stimulated by pain we've walked through and wanting to help other people not walk through that pain. So I do have a gift of empathy, which I I think is probably part of mercy. Uh, my, my wife would not consider herself the most merciful either, which makes us quite the couple. But, uh, but she really has kind of a gift of harmony. She wants to make sure everything, everybody's, she, she wants to see all sides of things to, because, so that everybody's getting along. Listen, if mercy is your motivation, you're going to be more concerned about people's emotional needs than about their physical needs. In other words, what are you going through right now? What's, what's really happening? And it's interesting that you'll see that exhibited in certain cultures sometimes more than others. When my brother and sister and I were um, looking for a place for my mom to spend out the rest of her life as she got uh, quite a bit older, we went to several uh, homes, uh, uh, assisted living uh, places. Every one of them was run, at least in the area we looked, every one of them was run by people of the same nationality. And it happens to be a nationality that I know well that has a deep value of mercy in the midst of their culture. Some cultures place a value on mercy more than others. And uh, I, I got to say, that's, that's an incredible thing. Mercy people are vital to have around. They add humanness to any organization. They, they, if you have a gift of mercy, I want you to know you are necessary. You are really valuable, and I really appreciate that. So here's a a quick conclusion here. These, these gifts are pretty important, and each of them are vital to the operation of any organization, whether it's, whether it's working at IBM or, or whether it's the um, uh, contractors that are operating or whether it's a church. Every one of these gifts are the things that make us who we are, and we see through different lenses, and all of these are vitally important because if everyone happened to be uh, try to try to teach somebody else, and who's going to clean up the mess? And if if everyone shows mercy, who's going to go get the new cup of coffee or figure out how to solve the problem that needs to happen? And and if if everyone just runs and mops the floor and and uh, and is serving in some area, then then who's going to take care of getting the job done or seeing the direction we need to go for the future? We need each other. And that's what Paul's saying here. And he's saying, God's instilled these things inside of you. And so when we look at this, just as our bodies, it says in verse 4, just as our bodies have many parts and each part has a special function, my heart and my kidney cannot be interchanged with each other. They each do what they do. Just that, the same way, he says, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body and we all belong to each other in his grace God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. And if we don't understand the gifting God has given to other people in the church, we're going to have battles within the church because we won't value the gifting that's in other people. And we need to learn to value not just the things God's placed in us, but the things God's placed in the person next to you, the things that God's placed in the person you live with at your home, the people you work with in your workplace. And so learn to discover those things. And the church can be a place where if we make the determination to allow the gifting the Father has given us to be used according to his plan, then we'll start to use it for something other than selfish means. What has God made you to be? Who are you? What are you? 
And I want to encourage you, spend some time. Maybe you go back to this list and read through these seven things in Romans chapter 12 and verses 7 and 8 and just look at those. Spend a little bit of time with them and ask the Lord, what is it that you've made me and how do I develop that into what it should be? Because those are the things that the Father has given us to help us fulfill God's plan in the world around us. So Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters and in this room, in all the rooms on this property, those that are connecting with us online, those that, that uh, are, are uh, participating at Sawtell uh, campus, Lord, I, I give you thanks for each and every one. And each and every one of us are individual and unique in the creation, uh, how you've made us to be. Lord, let us recognize the value that each one has to offer. And let us recognize the unique gifts that you've placed in us and learn to utilize them for the sake of your kingdom. Lord, we realize these gifts exist uh, in everyone, but Lord, let us be people that determine how to utilize these for your kingdom's sake. How can we be part of your body, knit together for the purpose of what you have for all of us to become? Lord, I pray that you would let us not be conformed to the thought processes of the world around us, but instead let us be transformed that our minds would be renewed. Which, Lord, causes me to just be so sensitive right now to people that may be here that have never (coughs) gotten their life in the right place with you. Church, keep your eyes closed, your heads bowed for a second. I just want to say, if you're here in this room, in any of the other rooms on this campus, if you're connecting with us at Sawtell, if you're online with us, I want to say the most important thing that you can do is make sure your relationship with Christ is in the right place. You heard Pastor Tim say uh, a, a little while ago that, uh, that Christ emancipated us, made freedom for all of us, but we have to determine if we're going to access the freedom that he's given to us and walk out of the slavery that the world tries to instill in our lives. And if you're here today and you want to open your heart to Christ, whether you're in any room here or at Sawtell, whether you're online, if you're online, I'm going to ask you to do it this way. If you'd extend your hand toward this, whatever you're watching this on, and you might say, well, Pastor Doug, that's ridiculous. You can't see me do that. But God can, and it's an action of you just reaching out. So I'm going to ask people here to reach out in just a moment too. In every room, there is someone standing in front. I'll be in the front of this room. There's someone in the front of each of the other rooms and at Sawtell. And if you're here and you'd say, I want to open my heart to Christ. I need to either get my relationship with him right and give my life to him for the first time. Or maybe you've made that decision a long time ago, but you have not been living it out for Christ's sake. Then I want to invite you to step back into that relationship with him because you'll never know who you are if you don't know the giver of gifts. And so if you're here and you'd say, Pastor, pray for me because I need to open my heart to Christ or I need to come back to Christ. You just raise your hand. In each room, there's someone that's going to connect with you and identify with you. But if you're here and you're saying, that's me, I need to open my heart to Christ. I need to make him the Lord of my Savior. Just raise your hand. Let our eyes meet. Look up at me right now if that's you and the decision you're making. I agree with you. Today, Jesus comes to be the Lord of your life. Are there others that are saying, yeah, I agree with you too right there, sir. And I agree right there. I agree with you, sir. Anyone else, just just wave at me. I don't want to miss you in any room. Just make sure, wave if there's anyone. Yeah, man, I agree with you. Good choice. So, Lord, for these that are making that decision, I want to give you thanks because they're making a decision to say, I want to get things straight in my life with you first, Lord. And then the things can be worked out about who they are and who the Father God has created them to be. But, Lord, thank you for the salvation you bring to them, bring forgiveness of sin, and now let them walk in the wholeness of who they are in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.